Ladies and gentlemen, a um, very good morning um, and welcome to the, uh, the Armitage Centre, our latest addition to this wonderful city. And isn't it, uh, isn't it a great uh, auditorium? Um, this is the Toowoomba Hospital Foundation Pure Land Learning College Research Scholarship Grant Presentation. I'm so delighted that everybody could take time this morning to come along. It's indeed a very special occasion uh, for us at the Foundation. Uh, we've had an association with the Pure Land Learning College now for uh, over 13 years. Um, and during that time, uh, the Master, uh, Venerable Chin Kung, uh, and the Venerables and the members of Pure Land Learning College have made um, considerable donations to the hospital foundation in relation to education and for research. And um, it's just wonderful. The master travels the world, as we know, and it's just wonderful to have him in our city. Uh, and we feel so very privileged to have him here this morning uh, as part of our presentations. There's only been the odd occasion uh, that the master has been home, and we wanted to make it special for him. Um, before I do the, um, the introductions, um, I should introduce myself. I'm Peter Rukas, the CEO of the Toowoomba Hospital Foundation. Um, and first and foremost, I would like to, uh, to recognise uh, our traditional owners of the land, the Jibal and Jarrawa people, for the, uh, the elders, past and present, and thank them uh, for the opportunity to, to be here and be on this great land. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is very important to recognise our heritage and our culture. And uh, the Aboriginal people are, are some of the oldest living uh, humans on earth. And I'd like to invite a great friend um, who has uh, made himself available this morning to come and, and welcome you to country. He is Uncle Darby McCarthy. And I'd like Darby to come forward and, and welcome you all here this morning on behalf of the, uh, the Indigenous local people here on, uh, on the Darling Downs. Welcome, Darby. Thank you, Peter. It is a, uh, a great honour to uh, welcome you here to Pure Learning and uh, for the Hospital Foundation. Uh, I was talking to uh, uh, Chancellor John Bilbush outside and I said uh, two very important issues for all, uh, education and um, health. Uh, learning uh, is, a, is a very important part of us and um, for, uh, for this, uh, the foundation, uh, Peter, who's chairman of, invited me along uh, to, uh, to acknowledge the Gaibal and Janawa people. I'm here to do that. And uh, for the carers of this part of the country, the Gaibal and Janawa people, uh, welcome to our, to our little, little camp here. And um, we, uh, we welcome all past, present and future uh, the Gaibal and Jarawa people, and um, I believe that we've got our, uh, our locals doing a little bit of a dance here uh, later on, the Kumo dances, so uh, I'm sure you will enjoy that. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me along, and most welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, if you, um, if you don't know the background um, to Derby, while he might be Uncle Darby McCarthy here and welcoming you on behalf of the Jarrah and Jibal people, um, he is one of Australia's greatest sportsmen. Uh, he, wrote, he was a jockey of extreme skill. Um, he's a life member and been inducted into the Hall of Fame of the Victorian Racing Club. And uh, he has been duly recognised. And I think sometimes we, uh, we forget just how good this guy is. And I'm so delighted to have him here and be a part of uh, our presentation this morning. So thank you, Darby, for coming along. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I've got a surprise for the master. I don't know that he really expected this, and I don't know if you expected it, but uh, I'm very delighted uh, to introduce you to the uh, Kuma Didgeri Art and Dance Group, uh, led by William Hopp. So, ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome our Indigenous local dancers. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of Jarrah and Gaibal people, the elders past and present. 
I'd also like to acknowledge my people and our dancers people, the Puma uh, tribe of South West Queensland, and also my father's people, the Murrigan people of South West Queensland. Uh, so now what I'd like to do is uh, introduce my dancers, Jake and Heath. Next, we would like to do a dance for you. And this dance is a fun dance, and we call this dance Gurry Gun. It's a dance about the cranes going out searching for their feeding ground. They find a nice spot to feed, so they all land. They begin to feed off the ground, and then they fly back home and do a dance of celebration because their bellies are full and they're very happy. We also do this dance as a, a fun dance to get our, all our young ones up when they start walking and they'd always like to jump up and copy their uncles and their aunties and all their big cousins when they, um, when they start probbering and they are, uh, yeah, so this is the way we teach all our dancers. Garrigan, Dance of the Crane. Oh, yeah. 
Thank you to the Kuma Didge dancers. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, would you please put your hands together for the boys. Um, celebrating our culture and our heritage is very important, as I said before. And the didgeridoo is one of the oldest instruments, if not the oldest instrument, musical instrument in the world. And um, again, sometimes we forget just how important uh, our culture is here uh, in this great country. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, everybody here this morning. Most importantly, uh, Master Ching Kung uh, from the Pure Land C Learning College, the Venerables, um, the supporters of the Pure Land Learning College, uh, our Mayor, uh, Port Councillor Paul Antonio, has joined us this morning and with his busy schedule I know um, that this is very important to him. Also uh, supporting councillors uh, to the Chairman of the uh, Toowoomba Hospital Foundation Board, Ray Taylor, uh, the Deputy Chairman, uh, Andrew Violent, who wears uh, two hats. He's also welcomed as the uh, President of the Toowoomba Chamber of Commerce. Welcome, Andrew. Uh, and to our Board Directors that have come along this morning. Um, also, uh, we have an apology from our uh, Chair of the Darling Downs Hospital and Health Services, Mike Warren, but this morning we're represented by the CEO of the Darling Downs Hospital and Health Service, uh, Dr Peter Bristow. Um, I'd also like to welcome uh, Dr Peter Gillies, uh, who is the... Uh, Executive Director uh, and in charge of the Toowoomba Hospital. Um, the, uh, one of the hospitals that we support, but uh, probably the most important in our, uh, in our support from the Foundation. Uh, also, uh, Dr. He Hui Singh, uh, welcome Hui. Um, I had trouble getting my teeth around that sometime and my tongue, but um, welcome. And to all the other representatives of the, uh, of the Toowoomba Hospital, uh, ladies and gentlemen, one and all, you're all very special. Uh, particularly also, I might mention, 
um, the Chancellor of the University of Southern Queensland, our, uh, our great university. Uh, we're very proud uh, of the University of Southern Queensland um, and I welcome John Dornbush. Welcome John. Um, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, uh, what I would like to do is um, to welcome Master Jing Kung up to speak. But before we do, I just, um, the Master speaks in not a language that a lot of us know, um, but his thoughts can be translated uh, by a, a wonderful gentleman, um, uh, Stephen Tang, and you'll hear his voice uh, through your recorder. Um, it's a very simple device, thank goodness for me. Um, the on-off switch is down the bottom on the front, I believe. No, this one's different. Oh, up here. Yeah, it is on the front, but it's up higher. So you can turn it on, um, and then the volume control is on the side. No wonder I had it, I had it upside down, that's what I was looking for. Um, and then the volume control is on the side. So if you'd all like to, um, to uh, engage your uh, listening devices, and uh, without any further ado, I would like to welcome um, the Venerable Master Ching Kung from the Pure Land Learning College, ladies and gentlemen. Respected Mayor Paul Antonio, Peter, Mr. Peter Rukas, the Chancellor of University of Southern Queensland, Mr. Dorn, uh, Mr. John Dorn Bush, distinguished guests, morning. Today, I'm very honored to be invited to share a few thoughts with so many friends here today. I was invited to talk about uh, the secret to longevity and health. Over the years, many friends have asked me the same question. Perhaps it's my image, I look healthy to everyone. Especially that over the years, I've represented a few universities to attend uh, a few international conferences around the world. I've encountered many friends who later asked me, how do you keep yourself so healthy? And I have told them over the years to have a sound body and a sound mind. We, this physical body, it's like a machine. We need to always make it work. It's like a machine, if it doesn't move, it starts to rust. But when talking about a sound mind, we should try to keep our mind as pure as possible. So all of us, we have wandering thoughts in our mind. If we can keep it as low as possible, it will be best if we can totally eliminate our wandering thoughts so our mind is always pure, then not only will we have a sound mind, we will have a sound body. Uh, I always believe in the middle path. So when we do exercise uh, to our physical body, don't overdo it. That's one of the key. I have immigrated to Australia for nearly 13 years already. Prior to coming to Australia, I was always invited to come to Australia 
uh, roughly for a duration since 10 years prior to immigrating to Australia. And every year I will come here and give lectures for about one month. And I have always had very uh, close association with the universities, as well as the Aboriginal community. In 1998-1999, I stayed in Singapore. I stayed there for three and a half years. At the time, we did our best to help to facilitate mutual cooperation between the nine major religions in Singapore. And I believe we have done it successfully. Everyone from different faiths and religions, they treated each other like a family. Whenever a faith or a religion needed help, all the major faiths will lend a hand. And this has generated tremendous influence to a lot of people in Singapore. And at that time, the Australian immigration ministers, he heard about what I have done in Singapore, and he invited me to immigrate to Australia and perhaps do the same for the Australian community. And uh, here I am. I eventually chose Toowoomba as a place to establish the college. Uh, although, yes, in Brisbane we have an association there, but the headquarter is actually in Toowoomba. A lot of people have asked me over the years, why did I choose Toowoomba? I believe Toowoomba is a perfect place for a modern person who wants to cultivate to better oneself. This is the perfect place to do it. At the time when I first came to Toowoomba 13 years ago, there were only about 80,000 people uh, living in the Toowoomba central uh, CBD. And I was told at the time there were over uh, 80 languages being spoken here and uh, people came from all over the world, from different culture. So how do we uh, facilitate an atmosphere where everyone will treat one another like brothers and sisters? We can live together like one family. Look at the world news today. We see a lot of unrest and turmoil around the world. We really need to have an environment, a living environment that's full of peace and harmony. Back in 2005 and 2006, we initiated a demonstration in a very small town in the province called Anhui in China. The reason for wanting to initiate this demonstration or experiment, if you will, it's because over the past decades, uh, I have been invited many times to peace interna international peace conferences around the world held by UN and UNESCO. And I have always talked about the ideal um, of um, the values of traditional cultures and the religious teachings. But throughout the years, quite a few experts and uh, scholars, they will came uh, to me later and said that your speech was wonderful, but they are only ideals, they are not practical. That's why we decided to uh, sit down and devise uh, a possible demonstration of how the traditional teachings will actually uh, be influential to modern society. 
And after three years of working in that little town in China, it was highly successful. Now coming back to Tuongba, we have been here. Uh, the Pure Land College has been here for 13 years. And uh, after talking, conversing with many faith followers and community leaders, we all hold the same ideal to make Tuongba a better place uh, for everyone. Tuongba is very peaceful. It's a wonderful place to study, to uh, practice. So it's a wonderful uh, environment. And over the years, I believe more and more people have uh, came aboard to join us to make Tuongba even better. With the support from the mayor, uh, I believe we can do, we can make it better. Since last year and uh, May this year, we were invited to go to UNESCO headquarters in, in Paris to present what we have achieved in Tuongba. Last year, our mayor has led a, a group of delegation to UNESCO. And uh, we would like to continue this effort and make Tuongba really a model city for everyone to look up to. I believe in order for this to work, we must emphasize education. From a religious point of view, I believe religious education is paramount as well. Over the years, from various different experiences, we understand the importance of religious education. We hope we can bring true happiness, stability to everyone's life. And everyone can enjoy health and longevity throughout their lives. A lot of people ask me, what is Buddhism? I believe Buddhist teaching is always about happiness, being happy. Buddhist also talks about when our mind is pure, we will enjoy health. I still remember uh, when I was first approached by a group of friends uh, about how to uh, become more happy, healthier. Then we started uh, a series of lectures always held on Saturday. Basically, that class, is, that class talked about how one should uh, interact with another, how uh, to make our life uh, filled with happiness and fulfillment. In this regard, the teaching of Buddha, the teaching, the Christian teaching, Islam, the teaching from Islam, the teaching from Baha'i, uh, from many other faiths as well, we all are sure and we confirm that there is one true God. There's only one creator of this universe. So as faith followers, what do we need to do? Buddha has said it very clearly. Buddha talked about the four all-embracing method. The first method is we need to share and introduce the ideal of universal love, compassion. Share that ideal with everyone. 
And the first method that we need to do is the practice of giving. This is very similar to the six paramita talked about by the Buddha as well. The practice of giving has many levels of definition for the Mahayana Bodhisattva. It is actually giving up or letting go of afflictions. But let's go back to the four all embracing method. The first method is the practice of giving. We should try to invite uh, our friends to join us as much as possible. We need to interact with everyone as much as possible. We need to give each other gifts as many times as possible. This is basically the meaning of the practice of giving. The groundbreaking ceremony for the Pure Land College, it took place uh, more than 10 years ago. We invited all our neighbors uh, who live very close to the college, we invited them to share a meal with us. And we would like to uh, report to everyone where we came from, why we were there uh, in Tuomba, why we were here in Tuomba. And at the end of that report, we had uh, a vegetarian banquet uh, for everyone. Afterward, quite a few people approached us and asked whether uh, they can, uh, whether we, we will be able to host uh, such a uh, meal sharing event more often in the future because they thoroughly enjoy the vegetarian food. So from then on, every Saturday we had, uh, we have always hosted a Saturday friendship dinner. We welcome everyone to join us and we are like a huge family. And we have been doing that for the past 13 years. In this friendship dinner, I believe we are adhering to the Buddha's for all embracing method, the first method, the practice of giving. I believe between human beings, we need to have more interactions. We need to have more mutual understandings. And I truly hope that religious teachings can bring peace, harmony, health, and happiness to the society. The practice of giving talked about by the Buddha in the six paramita is more profound than the simple act of giving. It comprised and embraced a different uh, level of giving. The six paramita is really the way how uh, a true practitioner will practice. In this giving, we not only try to do be what's best for us, we strive to do what's best for all others. In a very popular Confucius teachings, it stated that as long as we meet up a fellow human beings, we need to do our utmost uh, best to love, to care for them. The practice of giving, uh, again, comprises of many different types of giving. The first type is the giving of wealth to lead uh, a life through our modern society, we all need wealth. And we do see a lot of wealthy individuals in our society today. Buddha taught us 
Why is it that a particular person is more wealthy than the others? His teaching was this. All of us have past, present, and future uh, generations. There is a cycle of rebirth. In the Chinese community, most uh, Chinese, at least, uh, believe in rebirth. And a lot of people believe in fate. And there is a saying that our destiny has been pre-written, and uh, we cannot change that. So if we put that aside now and look at our surrounding, we see some people are extremely wealthy and some people are poor. We each seem to have a different fate. But according to Buddha, this fate is not decided by God. Our fate in present generation or in present time, it's because in our past life, we love to practice the giving of wealth. This is the cause that will lead up to the consequence of enjoying wealth in this life. It doesn't matter which line of work uh, you will embark on, you will, always, you will always be wealthy because you have planted the seed of wealth in your previous life. If in our previous life we haven't planted uh, the seed, which is the giving of wealth to others or sharing of wealth with others, then in this life we will not have the cause of being wealthy. When I first uh, came across Buddhism, my teacher had told me, And I believe he told me the truth. He saw me as who I was, and he told me that I had not planted uh, the cause to become wealthy in this life. I will be poor, and I was a very selfish person uh, before. So in this life, I have no wealth to speak of. But I did. Uh, in previous life, love to teach others. So I have a bit of intelligence for this life. I'm willing to teach others. Then lastly, there is the third kind of giving, the giving of what the Buddhists will call fearlessness. When we donate medicine, when we help others, make others comfortable, this is the giving of fearlessness. And my teacher told me, if you haven't planted a cause in your previous life, you can do so start in this life and remedy the situation. I told him I didn't have any money with me when I was at that time, when I was much younger. And he told me, if you have one cent, do you have one cent in you? I said, yes, I, I do have a cent. Do you have a dollar? Um, and I answered, a dollar, I can probably do that. And my teacher told me that as long as you hold a mindset to wanting to give, whenever you see the opportunity arises, you do what you can within reasons to give, to share your wealth. And that's where I started the process. And I believe it is working perfectly. I've been learning, I've been practice, practicing this for 63 years. I did my best to practice the three kinds of giving. The giving of, of wealth, the giving of wisdom or teachings, and lastly, the giving of fearlessness. After learning about Buddhism, my teacher encouraged me to be ordained as a monk, to learn after Buddha Shakyamuni. He introduced me to the life story of Buddha Shakyamuni. He said to me, 
As a Buddhist, you must know who Buddha Shakyamuni was. If you don't know him, if you didn't know him, you would have walked the wrong path in your later life. Then after studying his life story, I realized that Buddha doesn't seem like a the founder of a religion. He's more like a social educator. He left his family at the age of 19, and he tried to seek the truth. At the age of 30, he let go of everything he has learned beforehand, and he went into meditative concentration underneath a tree and he was enlightened. Enlightened seems like a very mysterious word. But what that means is that this person, when he completely understand the truth regarding our existence, regarding the reality of this universe, we call this person enlightened. So, Buddha Shakyamuni started his life of teaching since then. The very first set of sutra, he spent 12 years talking about uh, the rudimentary teachings of uh, morality, virtues, and causality. It's almost like an elementary school teaching. Then he spent the next eight years teaching about junior high school, high school material. Then he, the next, for the next stage, he spent 22 years teaching about university level, teaching about Buddhism. And at the last eight years of his life, he taught about graduate school materials. So he taught for 49 years. There were four phases to his life in terms of teachings. Gradually, he helped everyone understood more about our life, about the universe. And I always believe he was a voluntary social educator, more than he was a religious founder. Of course, like all religious founder, he never charged uh, any uh, money, and he never cared uh, to distinguish who is learning from him. He welcomed everyone, regardless of ethnicities, culture, nationality, or race. He has never once uh, asked anyone to give up his or her own faith or religion. And we see this clearly from the sutra. There were many scholars from different faiths and religions. They will come and learn from the Buddha, and they have never changed their religions. They are there to learn about life experience and wisdom. And what has Buddha taught us throughout his 49 years of life, uh, teaching life? It is teaching about the truth of our existence in the truth about the universe we live in. I believe the philosophy given to us by the Buddha is of the highest form uh, of philosophy that's available to humanity. And I believe in 20 to 30 years, when science is able to prove uh, a lot more about what Buddha talked about in the Sutra 3,000 years ago, perhaps Buddhism will no longer be considered as a religion. So, it's difficult sometimes to grasp some of the more profound teachings from Buddhism. But uh, with a lot of the current advancement in science and technology, 
we do see quite a lot of what the Buddha has talked about uh, years before to be valid. The Buddha talked uh, a lot and very profoundly about who we are, why we are, uh, we share the same uh, living entity. The whole universe is one living entity. Uh, Buddha spent a lot of time talking about this. But coming back to the topic, the practice of giving, we need to learn the, I, the, the reason behind the practice of giving, the compassion, the wisdom behind such practice. When we practice the giving of wealth, we will gain wealth. Wealth is not for our own personal enjoyment. It is for all those who may need them in dire situations. We should keep our personal life as simple as possible. Quite a few people ask me, I look healthy, and they ask uh, me for my age. I remember when I first went to the a UN organized peace conference representing the Griffith University. And later, I remember there was another gathering. I was representing the University of Queensland. I was 75 that year. I think I was one of the oldest uh, person in those two conferences. So most people actually cared about why I am able to keep myself so healthy. They don't really care so much about what I talked about. So uh, here's my secret. Firstly, being a vegetarian is a very ideal practice. It helps greatly towards our health, uh, to me, being healthy. After, after I have learned about uh, the goodness for being a, uh, associated with being vegetarian, uh, I became a vegetarian right away. And it's been 63 years since, I, since I've been uh, being a vegetarian. And I believe it, this is a very good example I can show to the world. And secondly, don't be influenced by all the negative things in life. With the advancement of science and technology, the most harmful thing uh, is something that's been ignored by most people. Computer, internet, the television programs, they are not positive to us. When you turn them on, when you switch them uh, on, most of the content you see, they are talking about violence, different desires. We are being heavily influenced by these content, even our children. So what can we do? Yes, they have the right to broadcast, but we have the right to refuse to turn on my TV set. For over 50 years, I have not watched a single television program, and I do not look at the content on the computer, the internet. And I try to leave my mobile phone whenever I can. So no one will call me. Maybe once a week, once or twice a week, uh, the mobile phone will reach someone, usually not me. And then I will receive the phone calls. And where I live, I don't even have a telephone, a landline. 
So no newspaper, no magazines. And the book, the only book I read is the Buddhist Sutra. Besides the Buddhist Sutra, I also love to read the Holy Scriptures from other faiths and religions. And I find them wonderful. The teachings from all faiths and religions, there are so much commonality. So this is the way to keep my mind pure without any wandering thoughts. So when learning about religious educations, we try to understand the message from God. And when, when practice, we need to act as a messenger of God to help others gaining happiness and fulfillment. As a Buddhist practitioner, uh, I believe the Buddha has explained it well. Where does pain and suffering come from? It's because people don't understand where they come from, the truth about life and the universe. Once we understand that, one would have gained happiness and fulfillment. Our surrounding may be full of contaminations, but my mind is not contaminated. If you ask me, where is heaven? Where is what the Buddhists will call the Western Pure Land? Well, here is Pure Land. Here is heaven to me. I'm not in the middle of chaos. I lead a very simple, very uh, pure way of life. I spend a lot of time in Hong Kong, and I stay in the rural part of Hong Kong. The environment is very uh, beautiful, just like, very much like Tuongba. This is something we can choose to do. So uh, the practice of wealth, giving wealth, so I have set up a foundation, a multicultural, multi-faith education foundation. The donation will go in there to do what we are doing now. And then as a teacher, I will teach four hours a day, two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, and using the internet and the satellite television, we broadcast these positive teachings to as many people as possible. Yes, there are quite a few associations around the world, but the only true headquarter of Pure Land teachings is here in Tuongba, in the form of Pure Land Learning College. And through the use of internet, I will teach and uh, interact with many teachers, many students from around the world through the internet. I don't have to leave my recording studio. And we talk about the scriptures. We discuss about the teachings on a daily basis. In terms about the giving of fearlessness, I was asked by a reporter from the Chronicles just moments ago. She asked me why did I wanted to donate to the hospital foundation. Such donation, the donation of medicine, the donation of such knowledge, is to give fearlessness to everyone. 
Why am I healthy? It's because I donated all my future medical expenses to all who needs it right now. So I won't be needing uh, medical expenditure in my future. I know quite a few uh, friends who will buy medical insurances for themselves to take care of them uh, in later life. I really don't have this idea. I don't even have the idea of becoming old. I have no idea about becoming ill. Being 88 this year, I believe I'm still quite healthy. I can still engage life like someone in their 50s or 60s. I believe this is the result of the practice of giving fearlessness. When I do it and act as a model, people will believe. A lot of time people listen to my lectures, they say what you are saying is ideal, it's not practical. But for me, I practice them every day and it's truly useful to me. And I believe the teaching from the Buddha are full of truth. So the practice of these three givings is what I have done throughout my life. The giving of wealth will gain one wealth. And to gain wealth, we must use proper way, proper manner to obtain wealth. Then secondly, the giving of wisdom. We do our best to introduce to the world the wonderful teaching from saints and sages, not just from one culture, but from all culture of humanity. I have met up with many national leaders from around the world. We see that the world has is going through unprecedented uh, chaos and turmoil. A lot of people have lost hope for lasting peace and harmony. I believe the answer is yes. Turmoil and chaos is caused by humanity, and humanity can undo what it has done. When we understand what is negative in our life, let's let them go. When we write our mind and avoid doing all the wrongdoings, when everyone can do that, of course our society will be transformed to become better. Back to the experiment I talked about in China in 2005 and 2006, only after a few months of teachings of virtues and morality, the small town has changed drastically. This time, when coming to Tuongba, I have met, met up with many good uh, residents from Tuongba. We all share the same, same aspiration to make Tuongba a better place, to make Tuongba the first multicultural model city of peace and harmony. The ultimate goal is to not only influence people of Tuongba to enjoy a better place, but with this model, we influence the rest of the world. And I will very much like to report what we have achieved in Tuongba to the, to the world through the various channels. And I hope religious leaders, faith leaders, can shoulder up this responsibility because it is written very clearly in all the faith and religions. We need to do our best to help others, to gain peace and harmony. So I believe religious teaching is vitally important 
We need to practice the teaching of saints and sages in our daily life when we work, when we interact with people, with different things. We need to express God's message through our own behavior. We help the society, we help others, we help restore peace and harmony to our society. For the past 10 years, we have done our best to learn from various different traditional cultures. We understand the values of traditional culture and its teachings. As a Chinese uh, descendant, I know more about Chinese culture and history, and I believe uh, Chinese has kept the most complete uh, history and its teachings, and it's able to preserve them in a relatively good condition until today. And I also believe the Chinese language is a, a rare treasure to humanity. It's a language that transcends space and time. People who wrote an article 2,000 years ago, it can be understood by people today who study this language. Even 3,000 in the future, people who study the Chinese language can still understand this article. They will not misunderstand it. This tool, this language, I believe it's very unique to the Chinese language. Arnold Toynbee has suggested the same. Uh, they have made the same comment in the past. These scholars believe that Chinese, this language, is a wonderful tool to preserve human wisdoms and knowledge. But regrettably, we see that even the Chinese has gradually uh, stopped learning this traditional language starting about a hundred years ago. So there are not that many people, racial-wise, who can read the classical Chinese language. I visited uh, universities in the US, in UK, and in France. And I made a point to visit their Sinology study schools and department. And many of these European scholars, they can read fluently uh, the Chinese, uh, they can read uh, without any difficulty the classical Chinese language. And when I asked them how long did it take for them to learn this language, most of them answered three to four years. So with three to four years study, they can absorb the four or five thousand years of all the experiences, knowledge and wisdom from the Chinese culture. I believe it is worthy of our time. From these teachings, there are ways that will help our family to lead a happier family, to make our community better, and to better govern our country, and to make lasting peace for the world. A very famous encyclopedia, it is called the Four Branches of Literature, it is still being perfectly preserved. Uh, in the Chinese community. This, com this encyclopedia comprises of, of all the most important literature literatures for the last three, four thousand years. We're talking about the practice of giving and uh, 
We shouldn't focus on our own personal health. We should focus on the health of the family, our community, our nation, and the world. I believe there are ways for us to improve uh, everything in our life. If we are willing to take the time to do what we can, to contribute what we can, then let us do what we can so that Australia will lead the world in terms of bringing in a new movement of peace and harmony to everyone. That will be a wonderful thing to behold. Uh, I will end my talk here. Thank you. Thank you, Master. Your, uh, your words of wisdom are boundless and uh, your philosophy of giving um, is truly remarkable. Ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you that uh, in the time that uh, the Master came to uh, Toowoomba in 2001 and uh, to this very day, the Pure Land Learning College have donated over $1.5 million to the Toowoomba Hospital Foundation uh, for learning and for uh, teaching in the area of health and research. And I think that's a magnificent contribution um, to our city uh, and to our health uh, department. And uh, the generosity uh, continues. The master has assured me um, on a number of occasions, uh, Peter, we will donate every year. And I think that's just a magnificent gesture. And it is true of his philosophy of the master's philosophy of giving. We have, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, some of the words of the master that have been presented in some, uh, in a framed uh, certificate uh, that it hangs very proudly in the offices of the Toowoomba Hospital Foundation. And while the words may be in Chinese, uh, the, uh, the words in English just say it all. And I believe it's a great philosophy and one that we should all follow. Uh, and the Master has said, let love to meet the world. And I think we'd be a hell of a lot better place if that was to, ha to happen. And uh, thank goodness that we have the Master and the Pure Land Learning College with us uh, here as part of our community in Toowoomba. Thank you so much, Master Ching Kung. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we now go into the presentation of the certificates and uh, to announce our recipients of research for uh, the last year. And I'll ask the Master to present uh, the certificates to our recipients in that regard. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the first of our recipients uh, goes to Dr. Nigel Ganji, uh, experienced researcher, and the whole team will come down and collect the certificate. So uh, would you please welcome Ganji uh, and his team. Uh, a retrospective uh, cohort study to examine the clinical efficiency and effectiveness of the Toowoomba Hospital Geriatric Adult Rehabilitation and Stroke Service Model of Care. Um, the grant is for $26,855. The Geriatric Adult Rehabilitation and Stroke Service Model of Care was initially implemented in 2012 and allowed for the redesign and expansion of the subacute services within the Toowoomba Hospital. Using a retrospective cohort pre and post implementation methodology, the proposed project aims to examine the clinical efficiency and effectiveness of uh, the model of care, and this will be measured against the service objectives and the key performance indicators. Ladies and gentlemen, please congratulate uh, Dr. Ganji uh, and his team with their research award.
for that. Thank you, Ganji. And thank you, Masa. Our next uh, research award is for a novice researcher, uh, Ms. Deborah McKenzie. Um, Deb will collect the award certificate. Some of the team members are here in the audience, but Deb will come down and uh, collect that uh, certificate. It's uh, a project and research that will investigate the effectiveness of the Mums and Bubs Oral Health Program, and it's a grant of $17,000. The Mums and Bubs Program is a long-term oral health promotion program. The ultimate goal of this program is to have these women address their own oral health needs and support this behavioural change by providing mothers with the skills and information needed to maintain optimum oral health. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please congratulate Deb and her team on receiving this uh, research grant. I might add that uh, the program has been running in Toowoomba for a number of years and uh, the proposed study aims to examine the efficiency uh, of the program and the efficacy and increasing oral health knowledge and status uh, in participants and to evaluate whether the program meets the needs of the community. And it's particularly important uh, during the mum's pregnancy and into the future. Once again, please congratulate Deb McKenzie and her team. Ladies and gentlemen, our next uh, researcher and the grant, uh, Dr uh, Martin Lowe and his team. Dr Lowe is attending the Australian Orthopaedic Conference in Melbourne and he apologises. Uh, Dr Deborah Carroll uh, will come down and collect a certificate for uh, Dr Martin Lowe. Dr Carroll did a lot of the behind scenes work getting this project up and running, so she's very important in that regard. I'll tell you about the project, it's the analysis of the MAP screening tool in tri triaging patients with hip and or knee arthritis at the public hospital orthopaedic outpatient clinic. The grant is for $15,732 and the project will assess the validity of the multi-attribute prioritisation tool and the screening tool ensuring patients that are referred to a public hospital orthopaedically through the orthopaedic outpatient clinic that are likely to require joint replacement surgery are the most likely to benefit from the service offered. A comparison will be made between the MAP tool and the recognised tool, which is called SF12B2, an assessment tool and Harris HIP score assessment. Ladies and gentlemen, please congratulate Dr Martin Lowe and thank Dr Deborah Carroll for coming and accepting the award. Thank you, Deb. Ladies and gentlemen, now uh, our final uh, award recipient research grant um, is to a novice researcher, a young man uh, who is uh, very keen on research and I'm delighted to announce that uh, the Novice Research Award for establishing a drug monitoring system for regional Queensland has been awarded to Mr Richard Henshaw from Toowoomba Hospital. The, uh, the grant is for a little under $10,000 and uh, substance use and harm in regional areas is often ignored issue with uh, little systematic monitoring of trends in use and harm. This project aims to establish an annual drug monitoring system in regional Queensland specific to the Toowoomba area, including establishing data collection systems where necessary. This system will provide area-specific information on trends in drug use and harm and inform strategic responses. Ladies and gentlemen, please congratulate uh, Richard Henshaw. Thank you. Um, what we do have now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and we, we try to do this each year, is to uh, have one of our research uh, recipients from last year come forward and uh, give us a little bit of a, uh, a story 
and if you like a success story uh, from 2013. And what I'd like to do now is introduce you to uh, Heather Hoey, and Heather was involved in, and received funding from the Pure Land Learning College and the Toowoomba Hospital Foundation with the Delirium Project. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, would you please welcome uh, Heather. Good morning, my name's Heather and I lead a multidisciplinary team in delirium research. A physiotherapist, a psychologist, a CNC of geriatrics and an allied health uh, research guru who unfortunately has moved to Sydney now and can't really help us very much. Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Toowoomba Hospital uh, Foundation Pure Land Learning College Scholarship. Uh, we have also had really, really great in-kind support from the Darling Downs Hospital and Health Service. And recently, I've had um, a great deal of mentoring from a lady by the name of Terry Jackson, who is Professor of the Principal Research Fellow of the Northern uh, Clinical Research Centre. Uh, in 2012, we conducted a clinical audit, and this was backed up by a Toowoomba Hospital Service Review uh, into delirium prevention. It identified a number of basic deficits. Uh, formal baseline cognitive function uh, wasn't conducted. Staff had knowledge deficits uh, about screening, uh, prevention and management of the delirium. Um, they lacked organisational policy, uh, structured processes. Excuse me. So we came up with a charter looking at uh, a need to ensure that education regarding prevention, detection, management of delirium at Toowoomba Hospital was multidisciplinary. Uh, central to this was the identification of suitable stakeholders, engagement and enlist support uh, for the Toowoomba Hospital Delirium Group. We were actually a group of researchers that started from the bottom. Um, a lot of change starts from the top and trickles its way down to the masses, but we're actually base grade um, clinicians and our changes worked from the bottom up because we saw that there was a need for change and that we could do things better. Um, the project aims was to look at some incidents, to reduce morbidity and mortality, improve our screening processes and early detection of delirium. We're looking to augment, augment the documentation processes. It doesn't uh, work to walk up to a doctor and say, I've got an idea that this patient might have delirium without some way of validating what we believe is wrong with the patient. Um, we're looking at best practices. We're looking to reduce the disease burden on our patients, uh, to reduce the fiscal impact upon our organisation and also on the wider community and families themselves and to embed changes into our organisational practice. And really importantly, to actually teach people how to spell the word delirium. So what is it? It's actually a disturbance of cognition, attention, um, awareness. Uh, it develops usually over a short period of time. And the, the, the key thing is that it's, it's a change that's occurred within the last 24 hours or um, the last few days. Um, it's usually the direct physiological consequence of another disease process and as many as 80% um, of intensive care patients experience delirium. Uh, 10 to 15% of patients who come through the emergency department have delirium. Older people, of up to 80% of older people who have dementia get delirium. There are three types, and we usually recognise the first type very easily, uh, the hyperactive form. However, it was the hypoactive form and the mixed form of the delirium presentation that we weren't understanding. Delirium um, is actually considered an indicator of poor quality healthcare by the um, Australian Commission of Safety and Quality in Healthcare. They put out a paper that looked at ways that we could improve our recognition practices of delirium, our management and our detection. I really like this slide. It's really, really busy. And what a guy decided to do with a group of his mates was put together a concept map of all the contributing factors and causative agents of delirium. 
and it looks like a bowl of spaghetti. And this guy's Italian, so I reckon that's a pretty apt description. It's a breach of the blood-brain barrier for whatever reason. There are a lot of causes of delirium. We do know that there is increased morbidity, so death, increased mortality, increased length of stay in hospital, increased costs. It's independent predictor of mortality and long-term cognitive dysfunction. We used to think that it was just something that happened and then went away just as quickly. However, we've been able to see that delirium persists sometimes up to six months and up to years after the initial presentation. The multidisciplinary management is the key. Uh, physiotherapy, early mobility, good nutrition are uh, key to the resolution and uh, prevention of delirium. So we did a survey that looked at identifying uh, practice deficits and knowledge deficits. We had a pilot survey conducted in the intensive care and within the allied health and then we conducted it um, across the Tom Hospital Service. The information was put into Excel and exported to SPPS for statistical purposes. Um, look, data collection occurs on a daily basis in any organisation um, and it's huge. And trying to tease out little pieces of data were a lot more difficult than I um, anticipated. So the gross numbers of delirium are still being collected and uh, with information about uh, age and uh, demographics, uh, gender as well. Uh, stakeholder identification uh, for a base grade nurse was a, a mammoth task. Uh, a hospital is a bit like that bowl of spaghetti with lots of um, arms going out everywhere. And it's really, really important that you consider the, the various effects on each and every part of an organisation. Managing staff buy-in was um, an interesting uh, concept. Um, there are different types of change. Uh, a guy by the name of Rogers identifies different attitudes amongst people who are subjected to change. There's those who are innovators, there's early adopters, um, there's the early majority, there's the late majority and the laggards. We don't even worry about the late majority and the laggards. We just concentrate on those early adopters and the innovators. Bottom-up implementation was a key to actually engaging staff buy-in. The key learning objectives were prevention, of strategies, prevention strategies, identification of risk factors, uh, facilitating the early recognition of the condition using the CAM or the CAM ICU, um, increasing the capacity of staff to implement strategies that were non-pharmacological um, and to facilitate early referral. When staff are looking to uh, be convinced that there's a need for learning, there needs to be an element of control over that learning. Um, and we need to facilitate different learning styles and the way different people learn. So we had a whole lot of host of different learning strategies. We had edgy lunches, um, lunchtime uh, medical staff education, team handover education sessions, peer-to-peer -peer teaching, um, ground rounds. We had um, district clinical staff orientations. We've had um, mandatory training um, uh, opportunities, we've had fact sheets, learning packages, PowerPoints, brochures, brochures. Um, looking at getting champions in each different professional group, which having a multidisciplinary research team made it a whole lot easier. Um, laminated bed charts, medical records, um, computer screen savers that went district wide, branding. Branding was huge. I'm known as the Delirium Queen. And when I go out into the wards, people know me as the Delirium Queen and I've got a T-shirt on the back that tells everyone that I'm really keen on best practice delirium care for our patients. And I wished I'd invented this, you know, do the five. So when I go to staff, I talk about the important five things we need to do when we, talk to, when we do observations and uh, clinical um, recording of patients' vital signs. So it's temperature, pulse, blood pressure, BP and cognition. So we're going to do the five. Um, we talk about the canary in the cage. In the old days, when they went down the mines, they had a canary in a cage and a long stick. And if the canary fell off its perch, it meant that the air bag was bad inside the coal mines. 
So we teach that um, delirium is a bit like the canary in the cage for older people. If they've fallen off their perch, then there's something going wrong and we need to go looking for the reason. Because in older people in particular, delirium is an indicator that there's something else happening and we need to go looking for the reason. We have a target of 60% staff education across the wards in the hospital. We teach them how to diagnose delirium using the CAM assessment method. It's something that's done really, really quickly. Anybody can learn it. Doctor, nurse, allied health, dietetics. It has uh, four features and they get it on a lanyard card which the Toowoomba Hospital also very, very uh, generously donated a whole lot of money to helping me get them printed and laminated. Uh, the screen that you see now actually shows the percentages of staff according to their ward area that have attended uh, training and we're doing really, really well. Um, the yellow ones is orthopaedic. Uh, quick care is in the blue and some of the other staff are medical unit one, medical unit two and rehab, um, the rehab ward are sitting at about 50%. So since we've uh, aggressively started uh, targeting uh, staff education in the last three to four months, we've managed to canvas at least 50% of the staff and that's huge. We uh, developed a delirium prevention detection and management kit. Um, in it has uh, a DVD with uh, a lot of uh, PowerPoints on it. Um, it's got the procedure, it's got PDFs that uh, staff educators can print out of the posters, uh, the uh, patient brochures, the lanyard cards that they can get printed at their own companies. The delirium kit itself is actually supported by a whole host of really, really clever and smart people. Um, position statements put out by the Australian New Zealand uh, Society for Geriatric Medicine, um, the Australian uh, AMHAC Clinical Practice Guidelines, um, the New South Wales Department of Health has a, an ACE program working with older people in hospital, there's the Health Hospital Elder Life program that came out from the States. Uh, in Wales they've got something called the Delirium Room and uh, we have used probably all the best and put it in to produce something that's specific to our needs and for our organisation. We also were very uh, honoured to receive funding from the Trauma Hospital Foundation once again uh, for a co-location co strategy for patients with delirium. We've been able to show that patients who are co-located, who have delirium, so in other words they're placed in, in a, uh, a higher uh, nurse to patient ratio um, in an area specific to their cares, we've been able to show that they experience fewer clinical incidents than patients who have delirium outside of the co-location strategy. And that was funded by, as I've said, the foundation and also uh, Toowoomba Hospital itself. We've done a whole lot to um, embed what we're doing into organisational culture. Um, I'm very naive and thought that I could get this done in 12 months and it takes a long time to generate change that becomes part of everyday practice. Uh, the desire to do it best by patients is in all nurses. Um, it's important that we've ensured that there's an identified resource person and we've just found out that our CNC geriatric uh, nurse, her position has been made permanent so that there will always be a resource person for patients with delirium when I move out of the delirium project and back into intensive care. Uh, the adoption of the delirium kit by the entire district of uh, Darling Downs Hospital and Health Service is another way of ensuring uh, the sustainability of the project. The delirium best practice has also been adopted as an organisational goals for some of the wards in the hospital as well. So the advantages of what we've been doing, it's a bottoms up approach. Um, it attracted like-minded people, not people that were tapped on the shoulder and said, go out and do this. The government has said we must. Um, it's your job to do it. But it's attracted people who are really passionate about what they do. And I'm honoured to accept money on behalf of our group that allows us to 
to live our passion, to work at it and to share it with other people. Um, the clinical staff at Toowoomba Hospital were very accepting of my researcher status because I'm also a clinician. Ignorance is bliss. I have done a whole lot of things that are wrong and I do apologise to Peter and Brett, most sincerely. Um, I've just gone along and done it and occasionally they've called me up and said, oh, go back a few steps, Heather. There's a few I's you need to dot and a few T's you need to cross. Thank you very much for your patience. So where to now? Um, the Professor Terry Jackson is helping me write this paper and send it off to the BMJ, she tells me. Uh, Dr Melissa Coltner, I've got a trip down to Sydney to help look at some statistics with her. There's ongoing staff education and as I've said, project sustainability has been enhanced by the geriatric CNC and we're taking this on the road to the rest of the Darling Downs Hospital and Health Service. And uh, as soon as the learning online becomes open, we've developed a learning package where staff can access it at their leisure, at home, um, learn about delirium, learn about the detection and management strategies and uh, do it at the, in, at, in their own home. And that, that's a really good thing that has recently come online at the Tom Hospital. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm sure you can see the, um, the enthusiasm and the, um, just how much this lady has put into this project and, uh, and the foundation is very privileged to support her uh, with the Delirium project. She's worked the last two nights uh, on night shift and then she made sure that she was available here today to come along and present her research uh, findings. Would you please give her a big hand? Heather Harry. <laughs> Uncle Darby, you'd be uh, pleased to know that uh, Heather was uh, looking after one of our other elders. Uh, Uncle Dick Rose was in the delirium uh, unit, wasn't he, Heather? Yes, he was. And uh, he was as cheeky as Buggery, wasn't he? <laughs> Bloody cheeky, all right. But um, yeah, so some wonderful work being done by Heather. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, very quickly I'll ask the, uh, the chairman, before we close today, the chairman of the foundation to come and present a, a special uh, gift for the master and for the Pure Land Learning College. Um, if I can uh, read it to you that it's presented to the Pure Land Learning College and to Master Chin Kung and the venerables and friends and supporters for the, uh, the wonderful work that the Pure Land Learning College have done and their support of the Toowoomba Hospital Foundation from 2001 to 2013 and it has a picture of the Emma Webb building in the back of it. It's a beautiful uh, certificate, uh, if you like, or plaque and I trust that the Pure Land Learning College and the Master will display this proudly uh, at the college uh, and their partnership and association and friendship. Uh, with PLLC. So if I can ask the Master to come forward and uh, Ray if you'd like to present that uh, to the Master please. tell you uh, one thing for certain, that if you make a presentation and give a gift to the Master or the Pure Land Learning College, you'll be assured that there'll always be a gift in return. <laughs> you cannot, there's no way that you could give a gift and not for them to give something to you. They are such giving people, they are so beautiful and we're so privileged um, to have them uh, as our supporters, our friends and our partners. 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you one and all for coming this morning. The Mayor giving up his time, Uncle Darby, uh, the Cooma Didge uh, Art and uh, Dance Group, uh, the board of uh, both the foundation and the hospital, our researchers and go to it and do the best that you can. Uh, with your research, we wish you well. And I know that the master is very proud of uh, what you're doing as far as education is concerned. Thank you one and all. Now you're more than welcome to uh, share a cup of tea and a bite to eat before you go. I know it's a busy time, but I think we've nearly finished on time at 11.30. So please enjoy the rest of your day and go out and let love to beat the world. Thank you very much.